All right, so welcome. It's a great pleasure to, um, to introduce Ivan Todorov, uh, who will talk on Morita equivalence for operator systems. So go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Walter. And uh, indeed, uh, I would like to thank, to thank uh, you very much for the invitation, uh, for the possibility, opportunity to give this talk here. Uh, right, so uh, I would like to talk about Morita equivalence in the category of operator systems. So that's a joint work with uh, George Eleftherakis and uh, Genius Kakariadis, who some of them may be in the audience, I believe. Uh, so here's, here's the plan. Uh, here's the plan for, uh, for the talk. Uh, I will spend a little bit of time uh, on the uh, like samples of Morita equivalence in the algebraic setting, in some pure algebraic settings. And then I will move uh, on to uh, touching upon uh, Riffle's work, uh, transferring the, uh, the notion to the category of sister algebras. Uh, and then afterwards, I will go into the into the operator system category per se. Uh, and I will try to emphasize mostly the, uh, the points where, sorry. Mm -hmm. Now the speaker is muted. No, I, I asked him to unmute, so he will All come right, uh, just a second. Uh, let me see. Uh, I'm unmuted, I believe, now, yeah? Excellent. Now it's all right. Okay, okay. Yeah, thank you. Right, uh, yeah, uh, basically trying to emphasize some points where the uh, operator system category offers something different from the other categories uh, of various operator algebraic objects. Uh, and then I will try to... Uh, Talk a little bit about what is uh, what uh, what's the use of of, of this uh, Morita equivalence for operator systems in particular, right? So uh, it sort of begins uh, really with this uh, distinction that is uh, uh, common in, in mathematics goes through through many different uh, many different sort of uh, areas of course in mathematics uh, difference between concrete and abstract objects. So. Uh, Usually, with some kind of we can we have some kind of abstract objects, for example, group ring, algebra, sister algebra, for example, and uh, we like to think uh, about them in terms of their representation. So we have a family of representations of this abstract object as concrete uh, in concrete terms. And usually, by concrete, uh, we mean uh, that we view the elements of the uh, corresponding abstract object as some kind of transformations on a certain set. So in particular for sister algebras, of course, these are just star representations on some um, Hilbert spaces, bounded operator, linear operators on some Hilbert space. So the main idea of Morita equivalence is uh, to look instead of uh, the abstract object, uh, to look at the uh, representations and not just at a single representation of the object, by, uh, but at the family of all representations of the object. In other words, we are looking at the concrete manifestations of this abstract object. Uh, and uh, the idea is that uh, perhaps sometimes we uh, have access only to the concrete manifestations instead of the object itself. And I hope you've seen me for that, but it was somehow very tempting to uh, to refer, it was kind of <laughs> intended to refer to, to the theory of, of forms of, of Plato here. Uh, so Morita equivalence uh, is for two objects is uh, really the, uh, the idea of these two objects having uh, equivalent representation theories, right? So in other words, from one representation of one object, uh, we can pass to a representation of the other object and vice versa. So for example, uh, this is a typical, typical situation here. If we have uh, a ring, for example, and then you consider the n by matrices with entries in them rig, this another ring, uh, it, we can uh, pass from, we can pass from uh, the representations or the modules over one of the, those rings to a module over the, over the other ring. So here on the right, we have a different situation which seems uh, unrelated to the, previous, to the previous discussion whatsoever. Uh, but uh, I will try to convince you at the end of uh, towards the end of the talk that actually it is exactly the same thing. Uh, we have a certain graph, for example, this very simple graph here, 
and then we can inflate it, uh, we can add vertices, instead of every vertex we can multiply it, uh, add several vertices, uh, and then uh, have adjacency everywhere we had adjacency before. Uh, these two graphs uh, look very similar, especially when you look at them from, uh, from very far. Now, uh, in Morita theory, there are several equivalent ways to look at this, uh, this equivalence of, of representation theories. So these are known and as uh, Morita theorems. So one of them is the one that I started with. So there are uh, functors going both ways between the categories of, let's say, left modules over these rings, uh, such that when you compose uh, the factors in both, uh, both directions, you get uh, functors that are equivalent, actually equivalent to the identity functors. Then this condition is equivalent to at least two others. It's equivalent, for example, to being able to split, to factorize the rings in such a way that you see here, we can find uh, bimodules, as SR and RS modules, such that uh, these uh, rings can be split, can be factorized, mutually factorized that way. Uh, or equivalently, you can find what's called Morita context. In other words, you can find these, uh, these models again, X and Y, uh, such that uh, uh, you, together with them, you can find certain, uh, certain balanced, uh, balanced maps uh, uh, from say here, Y cross X and X cross Y. Uh, they have to be compatible with each other, satisfying associative, associativity conditions. Uh, and finally, uh, it's a stable isomorphism of, of these rings. So that's uh, an extra condition that was added uh, much later than the other Morita theorems. In fact, uh, this condition was inspired by the developments in sister algebra, in sister algebra theory by, by Riefel, as I will talk uh, uh, in, the, in the next slide. Right, so how does this transfer to uh, functional analysis, to sister algebras in particular, that was done by Riefel, uh, Riefel's works in the, in the 1970s. Uh, so for uh, sister algebras A and B, uh, he defined, uh, well, basically he defined two different notions of Morita equivalence, uh, strong Morita equivalence and just Morita equivalence. The most relevant, the more relevant, let's say, for, for me will be the notion of strong Morita equivalence here. And one of the shortest possible pro probably ways to define a strong Morita equivalence between sister algebras A and B and is to say that uh, there exists a linking algebra for these two algebras A and B. So in other words, we can put the algebra A and B. So here pi and draw some faithful representations. So you have made, uh, we have made these algebras concrete, uh, concrete operators, and I can find some subspace of operators, which is non-degenerate, large enough, such that if I can, if I put it on the diagonals here, of diagonally M, and then this will be the adjoint of M, uh, I get a sister algebra. So the non-degeneracy of M is an important condition, it cannot be skipped, but the algebraic conditions of this two by two matrices being, uh, being a sister algebra, they're, uh, quite simple. So here we would have things like that. For example, we will have, let me, let me skip the representations rho and pi. We will have uh, conditions like that. And we will have conditions also like that, saying that M is uh, bimodal over these two algebras. So this purely algebraic, this is, this is what uh, these three conditions are what, uh, what implies uh, what's equivalent that this uh, two by two matrices uh, form an algebra, sister algebra that would be in that case. Uh, this notion of Morita equivalence, the one defined by Riefel that way, uh, turns out to be, to behave well to all, but uh, the first condition actually, because of representation theories. Uh, however, it became well in particular for uh, the last condition here, uh, and you will see that's a stable isomorphism uh, for sister algebras. I will explain afterwards what is the use of this, uh, of this uh, kind of uh, weaker notion than isomorphism, more equivalence in 
sister algebras, not only for sister algebras, but for also for other categories. I will postpone that later when I talk about uh, multi equivalence in the operator system category. Uh, now, the natural question is, especially uh, in the 1990s, with the uh, sort of uh, explosion in the sense of uh, of of uh, quant based functional analysis in terms of operator space theory, uh, what happens in other categories? So, for example, there will define well -be well behaved categories of non self adjoint operator algebra, so operator spaces, then of operator systems. Uh, now, for non self adjoint operator algebra and for operator spaces, uh, this was uh, done before, and what was outstanding uh, was uh, a category of operator systems. Now uh, there were two routes taken uh, to handle to handle this question. So one route uh, by Bletcher, Muley, Paulson, uh, Kashap, and uh, collaborators of of, of Bletcher, by David Bletcher especially, uh, which ignored the uh, the presence of the adjoint operation whatsoever. So very roughly speaking, it amounts to the following conditions that uh, that I have here. Here, X and Y are some operator spaces. Let me compare to what I had here for sister algebras. So X and Y are some operator spaces. Non-degenerateness is still required, of course. Uh, cannot be taken to be, to be zero, of course. So that's one, one direction. And the other direction was taken by uh, Several other authors. I have uh, George Leferakis' name here uh, highlighted because he was the first, uh, I believe, to realize that uh, it is useful to take as much as possible the uh, self-adjoint, some kind of self-adjoint nature of even uh, non-self-adjoint operator algebra. For example, if you have a non-self-adjoint operator algebra. It, it's not closed under taking the joints. Uh, however, for example, it may have non-trivial diagonal, right? Which is a sister algebra in that case. Uh, so uh, George and, and his collaborators worked with the following conditions. Again, roughly speaking, I will I will make this precise in the next uh, in the next slide or so. Uh, the conditions here are uh, very similar to the conditions that that you see here on the left. But now you are just working with one space m instead of two different operator spaces and you're imposing the extra condition that this m uh, is a ternary ring of operators a ternary ring of operators is uh, something very close to a sister algebra so it's still a subspace it doesn't need to be closed under multiplication uh, but it is almost closed under multiplication uh, this condition is the one that makes a subspace uh, of operators ternary ring of operators, a TRO. So it has it has a triple product. You can multiply S T star R uh, and this again in the subspace. Middle in the middle, you can take the joint. The space M that appeared here in the definition of refill is certainly like that. So that this condition will imply necessarily that uh, this M that sits here in the corner is a ternary ring of operators. In fact, uh, every ternary ring of operators is a corner of a sister algebra and nothing else. So this is another equivalent way really, to think of, of TROs. Now TROs were studied by a number of authors. Uh, uh, quite, 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 quite a few people were involved in, 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 in sort of studying these, these objects and, and showing that they are relevant to, to operator algebras per se. Uh, and they will be the, uh, the objects of will pushing, of course, here, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this direction, they will be the one that will appear in the uh, multi equivalence of operator systems uh, definitions. So uh, what are operator systems then? So recall that uh, sister algebra, I will just consider the unital, uh, for most of the time, unital sister algebras, they're just a closed uh, in the topology of a norm subalgebra of uh, B of H. H is some filter space. Uh, B of H is the space of all bounded linear operators on H, uh, which is closed undertaking the adjoint. So it's a subalgebra closed and closed undertaking the adjoint. 
Now, what is an operator system? An operator system uh, we, we relax two conditions. Well, we relax the conditions that is subalgebra, so it's not a subalgebra anymore. It still continues to be unital, uh, containing the identity operator and closed under the adjoint. And we do not, in general, uh, require that it be closed even. So it doesn't need to be closed in general. Uh, when we consider a Morita equivalence, it is natural, very natural for this space to be closed. But very often, in fact, uh, one doesn't gain much by considering the closures. In a sense, the, uh, the metric structure comes as a consequence, uh, is incorporated in the order structure. So there is a very nice interaction between the order structure and the metric structure for operator systems. Uh, perhaps now that I say that, it is actually useful just to jump at the very last, uh, the very last line here. Uh, or very roughly speaking again, so this is just one sample of what's happening. Even we covered the norm from the order, and this is this is how it is done. So uh, uh, an element has norm of most one precisely when if you place it and the diagonal, the off diagonal, the x x star, and then have the identity operator diagonal, it's something non-negative. Now, uh, we have relaxed these, uh, these conditions and we arrive at uh, the notion of an operator system. And the idea here, the very rough idea of philosophy is that uh, operator systems will describe uh, structures, phenomena, they will model phenomena where we do not have completeness, there is some information lacking. So in other words, we are working under the conditions of partial knowledge of 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 of, of some some phenomena of some uh, uh, some process. Let me make this uh, precise. Uh, graph operator systems. What are those? So uh, I will come back to that later on. So that's why I have them actually here as one of the examples. Graph operator systems are the following operator systems. You start start with the graph on n vertices. Say uh, so. It's a simple graph. No loops. No multiple edges. And uh, you span, you consider a corresponding operator system in the space of all n by n uh, complex matrices by uh, placing anything that you wish uh, in those in those uh, uh, those entries which correspond to adjacent adjacent vertices, and placing zero where uh, the vertices are not adjacent. And by force, I put, uh, I allow uh, the diagonal also to be included. So I just by force include the diagonal, although I do not have original loops in the, in the graph. All right, uh, so here is an example. If you have the five cycle, this is the corresponding uh, graph operator system of the, of the five cycle. So it was Vern Paulsen, uh, Steve Power, and, and uh, Roger Smith actually who noticed that uh, one can phrase in terms of these graph operator systems, the so-called positive completion problem for, uh, for matrices. The problem asks uh, for the following, if you have a certain partially defined matrix uh, with the property that uh, all the fully defi defined uh, minors are positive semi-definite, can you complete the non-defined entries with some entries so that the resulting matrix is also positive semi-definite? So they found uh, uh, very elegant conditions, uh, an elegant way to start this problem through this operator system, via these operator systems. Uh, much more recently, I believe that probably a couple of months ago or so, uh, uh, Alain Cohn and, and uh, uh, Walter Van uh, Sulecom, they uh, studied uh, similar, similar operator systems uh, associated with uh, tolerance relations, what they called. Uh, Another example of, of operator systems, again from, from a different paper of, of, uh, of Kohn and, and, and uh, Van Sulikon, is uh, uh, what they called in their paper fair width operator system. Uh, so here you have all continuous functions uh, whose spectrum is supported only, whose the spectrum, uh, uh, the support of the Fourier transform, let's say, the support of the Fourier transform of this function is supported on these, uh, let's say, a fraction of the of the real line of the of the of the integers on it's a minus n and n. Uh, now operator systems are uh, actually not as uh, as uh, special as one can one can think. So this condition, the last point that I want to make here is that the condition of self adjoinness here is actually not uh, not so uh, even that condition is not so uh, so strong. What I want to say is that if you start with an arbitrary operator space, you can actually form an operator system and you can reduce many things about this operator space to the study of the corresponding operator system. 
So this, uh, this approach was popularized by Gary Paulson, uh, and it amounts to placing the operator system as uh, the off diagonal parts of two by two matrices and then placing the scale of multiples of the identity diagonal. All right, so perhaps uh, let me have a look at the. Yeah, of some uh, of some questions. Uh, yes, so first question, uh, perhaps I'll, I'll stop and, and address these. The first question, uh, TROs are uh, definitely more general. Well, Hilbert bimodules is the same thing as TROs, right? So if you consider closed TROs, these are precisely Hilbert bimodules. So these are these are the same things. Uh, so uh, the thing about the closure, I believe uh, there is uh, yeah. There's another question about the closure. Uh, so I talked about the non-degenerateness. That's the whole point, right? I mean, uh, you have to start with a non-degenerate uh, M uh, with these two conditions, and that's enough, all right? And uh, uh, indeed. Uh, Exactly. If we pass to the closures, this will be sister obvious. The third question, uh, they are the same. Okay, very good. Okay, so I believe these are these were the questions at the point. Right, all right, very well. So now uh, operator systems, uh, what is the exactly the category of operator systems? Again, they can they come in as a complete and abstract. So the concrete ones I defined is a self adjoint subspace of B of H containing the identity operator. Now, uh, together with, uh, with, uh, with the operator system itself that lives in B of H, uh, here comes uh, a family of operator systems, a sequence of operator system living in the uh, n-fold direct uh, sum of the Hilbert space H. So namely, I consider the n by matrices with entries in S. Of course, this if S is naturally in B of H, n of n, uh, m n of S is naturally in the bounded operators of H n, the n for direct sum of H. So therefore, I can talk about the positive elements in this uh, in this n by n matrix space. So this is my notation for the positive cone. So all positive operators that are that are in there. So I have a whole uh, sequence of cones that play indexed by the natural numbers and they're compatible with each other. In other words, I can conjugate one to the other if the sizes of the corresponding matrices are, uh, are right. Here, A for me is just a scalar matrix. So I can just uh, conjugate by a scalar, uh, scalar matrix and preserve uh, the corresponding cones that way. Uh, in addition, the uh, identity operator is an Archimedean matrix of the unit. Uh, in other words, if I know that uh, a small perturbation of some element, some self-adjoint element is positive, for any small perturbation, then the element itself is positive. This is a kind of version of the closure, the property, topological closure property. And it doesn't happen only for the identity uh, itself, but also for the ampliations with the identity, the extensor with the identity on uh, and, and. Very well, so now uh, the morphisms between the operator systems, uh, on the other hand, uh, are given as follows. I have uh, linear maps, these are linear spaces after all, together with every such linear map, I can consider the ampliated map. Uh, so phi n uh, is the corresponding map, linear again, that acts from mn of s into mn of t. Uh, it does act entry-wise on matrices. And I declare such, uh, uh, map to be completely positive is all those ampliations and and ampliations of, of phi preserve the corresponding positive cones. They say that they send the positive semi-definite cone of the first operator system into the positive semi-definite cone of the second one. Uh, then there is, of course, a natural notion of isomorphism that in that case, I require that both phi and phi inverse, which exists, are completely positive. And now uh, Cho Etro's theorem tells us that uh, if you are given a data consisting of cones alone. So you're given a certain vector space uh, with a star operation on it and certain family of cones uh, that are compatible in that sense over here once again. Uh, and uh, if it has a designated uh, median matrix of the unit, then in fact, you can find a complete order isomorphism of this particular V uh, into some V of H. So this is the uh, abstract object over here and uh, these ones here were the concrete objects. They're one and the same thing. Sorry, uh, can I say something here? Yeah. Or ask? I mean, so you say it's a complete order isomorphism, and I think you said into B of H, 
Mm -hmm. So that's important, right? It's not B of H necessarily. Correct. So, correct. Yes, exactly. So that will be into, into B of H only. So that will be a um, uh, complete algorithm also onto its image in B of H. Yeah. So, yeah, so that will allow all possible subsystems of B of H. Yeah. Complete order embedding, uh, perhaps, is a, is, a better, is a better way to say. Yeah. Uh, now, with an operator system, we have uh, uh, some canonical system algebras that are around always. So one of them is a system envelope. So, in a sense, that's the smallest, uh, that's the smallest system algebra generated by, uh, by the operator system. I will come back to that later, so I will not spend time, more time on that uh, at the moment. Uh, I will speak about that in more detail a bit later. Uh, and uh, system multiplier, in the sense, this is the largest system algebra inside uh, inside S, uh, over which S is a is a bimodal. Now, uh, what does this notion of uh, here of more ridiculous amount for uh, operator system? So here is the here is the definition. Uh, we have two operator systems S and T uh, living in different. Uh, Hilbert, Hilbert spaces acting on, on different Hilbert spaces. We call them TRO equivalent uh, if there exists a non degenerate uh, ternary angle operators M acting from the right space into the right space, uh, such that these two conditions are satisfied. So if I conjugate uh, T with M, I get something that lives inside S, and vice versa. If I conjugate S with M star in that case, I get something that, uh, that lives inside T. Subspace of T. Uh, and now the abstract, so that's entirely concrete. Right? I have concrete operator systems and a concrete ternary operators. Now, uh, the abstract notion, in order to, for it really to become a, a multi equivalence notion, it's very similar to what, uh, what Rico really introduced. Uh, so I call, uh, call SNT delta equivalent if I can find completely order uh, isomorphic images of SNT which are TRO equivalent. So I can find some maps that are complete order isomorphisms onto the images and some uh, B of H and B of K, such that the corresponding images are TRO equivalent. These are equivalence relations, both of them. And the first, uh, the first observation that, uh, that, that, uh, that one, can, one, can, uh, one, can, one can see is uh, that uh, Delta equivalence is the same as uh, stable isomorphism. So, in other words, let me explain uh, what is stable isomorphism in these categories. So, basically, this is the same notion for all operator algebraic categories. Uh, this is my notation for the space of the algebra of compact operators on a separate group of space. Uh, I'm tensoring. Uh, so S is an operator system. I tensor it uh, with, with the compact operators in the minimal way. So these are two, uh, if you wish, I can represent as concretely. So uh, uh, I, I, can, I can form the minimal tensor product of these two operator spaces. I take the, the tensor product of the corresponding operators, take the linear span, take the closure, non-closure of those. Uh, and similarly for T, and I get two operator systems that are completely order isometric, uh, isomorphic. And of course, uh, you will say immediately that, of course, this is not an operator system. I have tensor with something that is not unital. Uh, the compact operators are not unital. This is not, uh, not, uh, not a very serious problem. Uh, so I should mention that, in fact, uh, theory of uh, Operator systems, let's not call them operator systems, uh, uh, self adjoint operator subspaces of B of H would be the best, the best probably way to call them. Uh, they do not necessarily contain the unit, uh, was developed uh, actually starting uh, already from, from the 90s uh, uh, and uh, following up uh, re recent work of, uh, of, of, of Kennedy, uh, Manuel, and King. So uh, another consequence of delta equivalence for operator systems is that uh, I can pass through the corresponding uh, delta equivalence, which amounts to strong equivalence for sister algebras, 
of both the sister envelope and the corresponding sister multiplier algebra. So delta equivalence, the way I have defined it, coincides precisely with strong weight equivalence in case the corresponding operator systems are sister algebras. So uh, let me stop before I continue for the right. Yes. So the, the next the next thing I would like to, to mention is uh, how one uh, goes towards that part of the that part of the Morita theorems. So Morita theorems were kind of uh, given in, in several so in several different ways to speak about uh, two objects within here in particular case being Morita equivalent. And one of them is through uh, these uh, Morita contexts. In other words, you should be able to place your objects, R and S here, in a context, Morita context. In other words, you should be able to find uh, corresponding bimodules, uh, X and Y, and corresponding uh, maps that satisfy uh, the right compatibility and associativity conditions uh, uh, so that, uh, so that uh, the maps are, so these will be maps from Y, x into r the other one x plus y into s so this was a purely abstract very abstract uh, um, realization of the equivalence of, of modern equivalence so what is that uh, for uh, operator systems so in fact uh, we have we know uh, two different slightly different they of course very related to one can obtain uh, equivalent one can obtain the other from one from the other uh, but the one that looks a little bit further away from operator systems is the one that I would like to discuss. So the motivation, let me start with the motivation about that. Uh, it comes from uh, non-commutative graph theory. So first of all, what are non-commutative graphs? I will tell you directly that these are just operator systems, uh, uh, subsystems of matrix algebras. That's what they are. Uh, why are they called non-commutative graphs? So this slide is about why uh, uh, non-commutative graphs. Let me concentrate on this part here of the slide. Uh, so a non-commutative graph in MD, MD is just D by D uh, matrices, complex matrices, uh, is just an operator subsystem of MD. Why would we call uh, an operator subsystem uh, like a non-commutative graph? The story goes like that. Uh, so it starts with, uh, with, with Shannon's theory of information where he defined what's called the confusibility graph of a channel, of an information channel. So an information channel is just a family of probability distribution. So here the channel uh, is from an alphabet X into an alphabet Y, these are finite alphabets. Uh, it's a family of conditional probability distributions. For every uh, letter of the input alphabet, you have a corresponding probability distribution uh, which tells us uh, what is the likelihood that the channel sends the letter X to the letter Y. Now, uh, Shannon defined what's called the confusibility graph of this channel, and it has vertex set the input alphabet and adjacency given like that. Two letters in the input alphabet are adjacent in the graph. Precisely when uh, you can find a uh, letter from the second alphabet for that alphabet, so that uh, the letters X and X dash are sent with no zero probability to this letter Y. So you, you, you have, in other words, uh, the theoretical possibility to, to confuse uh, the letters X and X dash, X prime, upon receipt at the other side, upon transmission, after the transmission is done. Uh, so Shannon's motivation was uh, to study uh, for the introduction of this graph was to study zero error uh, transmission properties for information channels and corresponding uh, zero error capacity uh, capacities of such channels. Now there was uh, a similar development in quantum zero error transmission, and what uh, how is that done in that case so basically we are looking for a version of this confusibility graph in the quantum setting uh, quantum channel say from md into mk uh, has uh, this form the form that's that's given here so the map this will be a linear map uh, it will be given the way uh, i had here with some extra condition to ensure trace preservation uh, 
that's called the cross representation of the corresponding map. So in fact, every completely positive map, of course, due to the theorem of choice, has, uh, has this has this form. Uh, so what we are doing here, we are uh, considering the corresponding the following the following uh, the following products. They will be mixed products, and I have made a mistake here. The star should this is where the star should be here. So that should be uh, that should this star should not exist here. Uh, so I am considering the mixed product. Let me write it here once again. A P star A Q. A sub I are the cross operators of my completely positive map. Well, this is certainly an operator subsystem of uh, of the the, uh, the domain of this of this uh, quantum channel. Uh, Clearly self adjoint, uh, contains the identity because uh, remember, I had a quantum channel, I have trace preservation. So these operators must uh, add up appropriately to, uh, to one. A P star A P must add up to one. So it's an operator system. Uh, moreover, this uh, seeming dependence on the corresponding cross representation is only seeming. Uh, it's, it, is not, it is not dependent, this operator system is not dependent on the way I analyze my phi. And uh, now the motivation that this should be the right version of uh, uh, composability graph comes from the observation that if you start with the classical uh, information channel instead of quantum one, then uh, the corresponding operator system that you obtain that way here will be exactly equal to the graph operator system corresponding to the classical composability graph of the information channel. Uh, so that was the motivation of uh, Rooney Aldwan, Simone Severini, and Fez Winter, who defined, uh, who decided to call non commutative graph any operator system in MD. Of course, these, uh, these objects were actually analyzed uh, uh, before that. In fact, uh, there's uh, a nice paper by Arveson where he classifies, uh, he described this uh, as a complete classification of, of these finitely acting operator systems. Uh, they have uh, a large sort of body of literature, especially lately. The nice thing is uh, also that, in fact, you can, in a certain sense, uh, try to reduce the study of the graph to the study of the corresponding operator system, uh, graph operator system, uh, right? So uh, you can recover certainly the graph from the operator system, the graph operator system. It remembers uh, the graph up to an isomorphism. Right, uh, so uh, if these are uh, a right, uh, a nice nice version of, uh, of, of graphs in the non commutative world, then uh, the question is that what is a graph homomorphism? And that was, uh, that was defined by Dan Stalke, uh, who convinced, uh, uh, convinced people that, in fact, the right, the right thing to do here is the following. So basically, he translated the notion of a graph uh, homomorphism. Uh, in, in this in, in, in a non-commutative way, uh, uh, so uh, it, it extends so that it extends the, the classical the classical graph homomorphism, right? So uh, that's that's what the classical graph homomorphism is. This is the condition here. So in the quantum in the quantum setting, suppose that you have two non-commutative graphs S and T, uh, you uh, require then the existence of a certain quantum channel such that when you conjugate uh, T by the cross operators of this uh, quantum channel, you get something inside S. In other words, uh, let's see, if I take the span of the cross operators of my, uh, of my quantum channel, I get nothing else but this condition, right? So let me call it uh, script X, the span of those cross operators. Uh, the condition for a graph homomorphism, non commutative graph homomorphism is just uh, X star T X containing S. So that's exactly half in a sense, not exactly, but very similar to half of the Morita equivalence conditions. Well, in fact, it is exactly half because if you add the other one, they're just a, a very, very easy uh, way to, <laughs> it's just straightforward to check that if you have both uh, containments here, this will imply that uh, S and T are TRO equivalent. You can produce a corresponding TRO, namely the TRO generated by this operator space X. They're just straightforward. Of course, uh, what I'm not, uh, not explaining entirely here is the fact that we wanted non-degenerateness indeed. So for TRO equivalence, we, don't, we want this TRO that implements it to be non-degenerate 
Uh, and for this X here, we certainly require also for it to be non-degenerate. Remember that if it comes from a graph homomorphism, it is non-degenerate because uh, of the condition that we are starting with a quantum channel. So the identity is equal to the sum of uh, AP star AP. All right, uh, very well. So uh, now what is this abstract abstract way to, uh, to, describe, to describe this delta equivalence for operator systems? Uh, so uh, this here is how, how it goes. So you need to have uh, uh, corresponding multiplications, abstract multiplications, let's say. So you need to start uh, with, let's start with two operator systems, S and T, and with certain non-degenerate operator space. And then we have these abstract mappings. They will be trilinear mappings in that case. Uh, one of them will be from X star times T times X into S, the other one from X times S times X star into T. Uh, they have to respect the corresponding uh, diagonals, the corresponding multiplier algebras of the operator systems. In other words, if you place the identity in the middle, the corresponding image of X star and X in that case must live in the uh, system multiplier of S similarly for, uh, for T. And they have to satisfy uh, natural associativity conditions. Of course, here, if I end, uh, end up in, in T, for example, then I can act once again with X star and X on the other sides. In other words, I can form like a five tuple product, so like that. So I, I, instead of three, instead of three entries in my in my products here, the the square brackets and the curly brackets one, I can of course have five uh, if they're uh, they're, they're placed properly, uh, if they make sense. And you must have just natural compatibility condition conditions in, in that case. And finally, you have to have non-degeneracy, right? So non-degeneracy is something that, of course, is uh, all the time appears in one way or another. Uh, then we say that S and T uh, can be placed in a bi-homomorphism context. We call this, uh, this bunch of, of data. So we have S, T, X, and these uh, trilinear mappings. Uh, we call this a bi-homomorphism context. Uh, every time when you have delta equivalent operators uh, systems, uh, they are uh, bi-homomorphic. They can be placed in a bi-homomorphism context, certainly so. Remember that uh, there exists a TRO uh, that uh, conjugates them uh, the way I highlight now, and then you can define your abstract multiplication to be a concrete one. Yeah? So you can just define it to be uh, a concrete one in that case. So M uh, can play the role of this X. And the converse is also true. So in other words, if you start with uh, such kind of abstract, abstract data here, these five, uh, five objects, satisfying the right conditions, you can uh, find uh, corresponding concrete representations of S and T and concrete representation of X as well, uh, in which these abstract, uh, abstract multiplication, they are actually concrete. So they, uh, they can be turned into operator spaces that satisfy uh, uh, um, uh, honest uh, sort of uh, conjugation uh, and therefore TRO equivalence. So, uh, let me. Uh, I have five more minutes, so let me let me decide how I go how I go about it. Uh, so, of course, I, I will make the slides available. So, I have several points about uh, about the what is what is done in order to achieve Please. this complete. You can take Sorry. your time. I mean, you still have. Um, we can. Um, you can take it easy. I mean. Okay, so perhaps I take ten minutes and then leave five minutes for for questions. Thank you very sure. much. Thank Perfect. you very much. Uh, all right, so in that case, let me uh, let me mention then uh, what's being done here. So uh, this is the, the ideas here are, are probably uh, yeah uh, probably well known and, and, and probably done in different settings in different ways. So it's not something standard that one does in uh, in non commutative uh, non commutative analysis really uh, going back to, even if you wish to Steinspring uh, to the Steinspring theorem. Uh, so starting starting with with this abstract data, I want to define several things. I want to define two concrete two Hilbert spaces, two concrete representations of S and T, and a concrete representation of X, such that uh, I have this uh, concrete conjugation happening. Right, these conditions are satisfied there in these specific Hilbert spaces as operators. They will consist of operators now concrete operators. Uh, for S, I just consider some completely ordered isomorphic embedding into B of H. So this is my H, some H. 
uh, for k, uh, I consider the tensor product of H with X. X is one of the other bits of data that I have here for this uh, uh, context, Morita context. And I equip it with the sesquilinear form using the map phi and using one of the triple products that I'm given. Uh, afterwards, I have to portion out the kernel. I have to complete to obtain uh, uh, the fact of Hilbert space. That's my Hilbert space K, on which I have to represent the second operator system. How do I represent it? Uh, in the following way. This will be uh, this will be the representation that works that exists such a mapping T uh, from T into B of K. Uh, it satisfies and then it is defined if you wish through this condition here again using the triple product and you need to use of course the complete positivity of the triple product the non-degenerateness of the triple product to show that this is all all fine and well defined and the fact that psi is completely positive in fact uh, There, if you have an operator x, uh, little x in this capital uh, script x, then I want to get, I want to act on a vector h and to get a vector in k. But k, remember, is just the algebraic tensor product x and h. So I just tensor x with h. Fine. So that's very standard, I would say. Uh, and it turns out that. Uh, uh, it, it is all fine, it all works. So these compatibility properties of the uh, abstract triple products turn out to uh, sort of uh, uh, yield a concrete uh, concrete representation of, of all those objects the way I explained until now. Uh, finally, the uh, concrete relation that really uh, tells us that I have, for example, the first condition is the one that you see uh, here in the last in the last in the last state uh, last state equation the high rated one right uh, so going back to uh, the actual notion and what it is good for so one thing that uh, that we established for operator systems it was known for sister algebras before is uh, preservation of various approximation properties uh, so i will touch upon two of them here exactness and the local lifting property uh, so uh, exactness for operator systems generalizes exactness for sister algebras and it amounts to uh, the following uh, map the one that you see here being a complete order isomorphism so what i'm doing here i'm taking minimal tensor products all the time uh, a is a sister algebra i is an ideal of the sister algebra and I have two possibilities really to quotient out. If I have a tensor S, I could quotient out the ideal tensor S, or I can first quotient out the ideal and then tensor with S. So exactness is uh, this map being an, isom an isomorphism, a complete order isomorphism between operator systems in that case. Uh, the local lifting property is defined on the other hand through uh, the diagram that, that, that you see here Again, I work with sister algebras here and not just arbitrary operator systems. Uh, I require that every time when I have a finite dimensional one, E, map this unit of completely positive into the quotient algebra, quotient sister algebra, I can find the lifting up to the upstairs to the uh, sister algebra itself so that I have a uh, commutative theorem like that. Now, uh, how does these things relate to Morita equivalence and to delta equivalence that I define? Well, through tensor products. So basically, uh, to cut the, the long story short is uh, these approximation properties, these two ones and, and other ones as well of interest, can be viewed as nuclearity properties. So we defined uh, tensor products in the operator system category with, uh, with uh, Alika Brook and Bern Paulsen and, and uh, Mark Tomford. Uh, and then you studied the quotient theory of operator systems. And then uh, approximation properties often has to have to do with, with quotients. Uh, it turns out that many of the approximation properties, in particular exactness, local lifting uh, property, operator system local lifting property, can be expressed in terms of, the, of uh, nuclearity between different tensor products. 
So uh, for operator systems, there are several tensor products of interest. Uh, I will just mention in passing that in fact the maximal tensor product of sister algebra splits into bifurcates into well, the piece to these bifurcates into different tensor products for the operator system category. Uh, the approximation properties are first translated as nuclearity properties, and afterwards, uh, using the uh, uh, the TRO that implements the equivalence, one can show that uh, these exactness, for example, exactness or local lifting property, they are preserved on the uh, equivalence or delta equivalence here, the invariance for delta equivalence. Uh, all right, so I will I will skip the uh, the representation uh, theory equivalences. And what I want to do is uh, perhaps uh, mention, I said, uh, I mentioned the, the sister envelope, another uh, consequence, another consequence of the, uh, the delta equivalence of operator systems is that one can actually uh, obtain sister envelopes, so uh, transfer the, the, the way of one obtains sister envelopes for one into the one, uh, into the, the way one takes a system of the other operator system. How is that done? Uh, so the actual existence of, of the system envelope of an operator system was, was an open question for a while. Uh, then it was, it was established uh, in the 70s first by Hamana, uh, and then uh, much, much later on, a different approach was given to that. Uh, through so-called uh, maximal mappings. Um, these are UCP mappings, unit of completely positive mappings that are not dilatable non-trivially. Uh, so basically, uh, Bleacher and McCullough, they, they show that one can concretely obtain the sister envelope of, of a certain operator system, provided that one has a nice uh, representation of the, of the operator systems on some filter space. And now, uh, delta equivalence has the property that in fact, Every time, every time you have uh, you have a way to obtain a sister envelope, the sister envelope somewhere, you can use the uh, functors that transport one of the representations of S to a representation of T to obtain again a way to obtain the sister envelope of T now. So basically, uh, in in the terminology of uh, Dichel McCullough, maximal maps are sent to maximal maps. Maximal maps of S are sent to maximal maps of T as well. So this is another consequence of uh, this delta equivalence uh, for non-commutative uh, quantized function of, of quantized analysis really in, the, in the sense of Arveson starting from the from the from the late uh, from the late 60s. Uh, I promise that I will stop uh, five minutes too, and indeed I have one more minute. I will I will manage I think to stop there. Uh, the only thing I want to say is that uh, I want to revisit the. The very, very first example that I have uh, that I had uh, given with graphs, right? So remember, I gave these two graphs, pictures of two graphs, and say they're kind of Morita equivalent, these, these two graphs, if I add more vertices. Well, this amounts to nothing else but tensoring the graph operator system with MN, of course. I just amplify the vertices. Every vertex be becomes say, five vertices, right? This is tensoring with M5. Uh, so the natural question is okay, what happens for uh, non commutative graphs and for graph operator systems? What is the notion? Uh, of this Morita equivalence for them, for these specific classes. Well, uh, for non commutative graphs, uh, delta equivalence is exactly the same as TRO equivalence. Fair enough. Uh, this uses the fact that the sister envelope of, of, of an operator system due to a result of Ortiz and Paulson uh, is just a sister algebra generated by this uh, non commutative graph inside an N. Uh, for graph operator systems, uh, what's happening is the following. Uh, so the characterization is the following. Two graph operator systems are delta equivalent precisely when they are the pullbacks of isomorphic graphs. So you can find, if you want the same graph and two different pullbacks, we are basically, pullbacks are basically we are adding vertices, but possibly of different sizes at every vertex of the original graph. And then you're having the corresponding adjacency uh, analogously added. These are the same thing. So this is the characterization of that equivalence for graph uh, for graph operator systems. All right. So I have I have some uh, I had some some mention of some 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 proofs in the slides and also some details here. Say details here. I will not uh, I will not uh, talk about that uh, because the time is is really ending. I had some some uh, kind of other comments and questions, but I will leave that that uh, that on the slides. I think, and I will I will I will stop now. So thank you very much once again for this uh, opportunity.
So thank you. Thank you very much. A great talk. Great start of the new year, new episodes of this series. So more questions. We already had several in the chat, so and more questions or comments. I have, a, I have a question, if I may. Uh, a nice, nice talk, Yvonne. I was wondering, um, with your, uh, just if we take, say, delta equivalence, you, you talked about um, the implications for C star envelopes and... and Which um, equivalence, sorry? Delta equivalence. Del yeah, delta, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Have you thought at all about um, whether that would extend to, say, injective envelopes of the of the operator systems? No, we haven't. We haven't. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's a good question. I don't know. We haven't thought. Uh, my impression is it will be too far to. Yeah. To that. Yeah. Because then, here we have. Sorry. Yeah, and another question I was thinking about for the um, non-commutative graph operator systems is. Uh, does does the equivalence extend at all to the operator system duals? Uh-huh. Uh, I don't know. I don't know that. Uh, okay. I don't know that. Uh, this is much more likely. Yeah. Okay. This yeah, is much thank more you. Likely. We haven't thought about it, but that's much, much more likely, yes. Yeah. That's a good question, actually. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, the problem there is, of course, with the product, right? Because, uh, yeah, uh, I, I don't see how to incorporate the product into the deals. So it, it needs some thought, I think. Yeah, it's not obvious for sure. Yeah. yeah. One can one can try to, to do that to, to see what's happening for graph operator systems because, I mean, the graph, for graph operator systems, one can uh, one can see the the duo as a portion of operator system, and one, one can one can try to check that something like that's too bad. But I, I don't know. I don't know. Are you saying this is valid at the classical for classical graphs that you can have some kind? Of... I don't. I don't know. No, but it will no, be easier it's... there. It will be easier because if you have a graph operator system, then. Uh, it's a sub operator system of an N, uh, so therefore it's due to the portion of an N. It could be the portion of an N by the space generated by the outside of the vertex of the of the edges matrix units. So it's something concrete that you can, you can play with. Okay. I also have a question, if I may. Sure. So, um, do you have many examples of Morita equivalence for operator systems outside of the non-commutative graph theory or the C star algebraic setting? Yeah. So, uh, the other source of examples I didn't uh, didn't talk at all about it, but it was uh, actually then here is uh, so that's that's also a good question actually. So, uh, function systems, right? So, function systems are not uh, commutative versions of of uh, operator of uh, operator systems. So these operator system versions of commutative sister algebra if you wish. So these are just operator subsystems of commutative sister algebras. So uh, these ones are uh, dealt equivalent precisely when they are completely the isomorphic. Fair enough. Yeah, that's one thing. Uh, but then one can ask uh, what is happening uh, if an operator system is multi equivalent, delta equivalent to a function system. So that is a more interesting question. Uh, so we believe we have uh, we have a corresponding answer with uh, with Evgenius and and with George. Uh, yeah, I need to yeah, kind of complete some details, but basically we are having, uh, roughly speaking, operator systems of type one. Uh, basically, some um, you have it fibered over some 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 space, some topological space with uh, fibers that are matrix algebras. So this will be multi equivalent, that equivalent to function systems. Possibly non-commutative operator systems that are commutative, that are commutative function systems, commutative ones. 
so this is concerning function systems. Outside of that, um, I think the, the, the answer outside of that is, uh, is exactly the answer as it goes for sister algebra. So basically it is those that are stable isomorphic. Right, I, I don't know. Right. Uh, I don't know of more specific. Um, at the moment, it doesn't come come, come to my mind some, some more specific classes or example to say at the moment. But I mean, these are the stable isomorphic ones. Mm -hmm. Nothing else. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks. Anything else? Can I ask a question, if I may? Of course. Um, Ivan, uh, is it? Uh, can I take you back to um, semi-normalizers of operator algebras? And there, there, the authors discovered a, a local structure of the space of semi-normalizers. Is there any corresponding uh, idea here for these uh, uh, TRO equivalence by modules? What do you mean by uh, local structure? Is to be local structure meaning uh... a local linear structure? The set of semi-normalizers between two operator algebras uh -huh. turned out to be locally, uh -huh. locally uh -huh. linear space. Right, right. Uh, right, so this goes into a different direction and I believe also interesting. Basically, you're asking about the, uh, you now looking, while well, you're fixing two operator systems and you're asking which are the TROs that will implement the Morita equivalence between them. Exactly. Right, so this is, I have no idea uh, what's happening there, but I mean, uh, definitely, uh, definitely for sister algebra. This is uh, this is definitely studied, and definitely the uh, uh, experts experts in the audience much much more than me uh, about that. But uh, um, no, but you are the there, there, there is, I believe, uh, uh, for so. <laughs> So, so, so the way it goes for operator algebra, not so for joint operator algebra, is that every normalizer we put it in a TRO that uh, consists of normalizers. Right. The analogous thing here is 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 the one that I, I discussed uh, here. That if you have, I think I think it's an interesting it's an interesting question actually. So let's uh, let's see. So do do we have time for for an answer, uh, Walter, or should 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 we postpone this for? I don't know. I, I don't want to, to take time of the, the audience. So uh, I think it's fine. I mean, and of course, people are free to, uh, to well, leave. Okay, the excellent, group. excellent. So if you uh, wish yeah. to let, enter recording, that's also fine. So if that's uh, um, yeah, fine with, with anything. So so if you have if you have uh, if you have uh, an operator space satisfying these two conditions, they will immediately get a TRO satisfying this condition. So this is the answer to your question. Of course, you ask for a single operator, but then in that case, you are just talking about the one-dimensional space that satisfies this uh, relation. Fine. So yeah, in a sense, yes. If you have a one-dimensional space X satisfying these two conditions, then you can pass to the TRO that satisfies it also. So the answer would be yes, I guess, to your question. May I ask another question? Mm -hmm. Um, so thanks for the nice talk. Um, so I was wondering, like, I'm like the, the, the definition of yes, like, oh, hi, yes, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so like the, the definition of a TRO itself, I mean, like, is a concrete one, right? I'm like, so mm -hmm. is there also like a, in a way, like an abstract characterization of TROs in the same way, like yeah. operator spaces? Corners of sister algebras. Basically, you have a sister algebra and you cut a corner of it. That, that's what it is. Or if you wish uh, to Hilbert Hilbert by models, it's another abstract abstract way to see them. Yes, yes, uh, but but the corner might might not be like I mean, like you might have some overlap right between x and x star, say for example. Mm -hmm. um, but okay, so you say there is an abstract characterization, and in Hilbert by models. Like... Hilbert by models. So this is a Hilbert sp uh, 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 linear space so that's a uh, Banach space that ended with. Uh, Yes. Uh, it says linear forms into two different sister algebras, uh, and then they satisfy natural compatibility relation. You can shift yes. one of them into the other. Yeah. Yes, yes. So my question then, like, I'm like, so because I'm like, your definition of, uh, or the definition of, uh, of a TRO equivalence, right? It says like, you have a concrete representation into some, some B of H or B of HK. Um, mm -hmm. And so then like the, the product would be nothing but like something like maybe 
like a hard group uh, tensor product like of operator modules maybe something uh -huh. like that. Very and, good, uh, very good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes, and yes, uh, so yeah. my question then, I'm like, so I mean, is there maybe something like uh, like a way like to characterize mm -hmm. uh, Hilbert such Hilbert modules as uh, I mean, like, so to make sense of like uh, the adjoint of a Hilbert module, mm -hmm. um, like as like does it really like uh, I mean, like, can one also like characterize it as an operator space, say for example? And some some other operator space Y, which could be viewed at as like a, as X star, such as like a any time operator space yeah, so, tensor products. Mm -hmm. So uh, yes, I understand. So uh, yeah, that, that's that, that's a good question. I think so. Any time any time you have a representation of X completely isometric, then X star is uh, defined. So X star is well defined. Yeah, <laughs> for any operator space, that X star is well defined. You start. You can take it in any complete complete asymmetric representation first. Now, about the tensor products, it, I guess, so you can tell me whether I'm, I'm getting it right, your question here or not. I guess you are asking about uh, something like that in our category. Is, yes. Is, okay, yes. Very good. Uh, very good. So, yes, uh, here's the answer. Here is the answer uh, to that question. It's in here. Uh, mm -hmm. It's in here. You're asking about uh, possible ways to uh, whether there is a way to factorize it, like we do for algebraic, uh, like the ring, for example, like factor R S X Y, and the other one is Y X. Yeah, yes, it is possible. Uh, it is possible. Uh, Evgenio and George, if they're not here, uh, go back to our draft. Uh, we need to finish it soon. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, basically, yeah. Well, we 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 hope we hope we have it. Uh, yes. Soon, yes. So yes, there is a way you can we can factor you can factor t as uh, x star s x and the other one yes, the other yes. way around. So that's possible to do. And here the question is which tensor product you put. Yes. And the answer is it is not the hardware of tensor product, but it is metrically equivalent to the hardware of tensor product. So okay, so but uh, you say there is another so seen as uh, operator systems, but I mean like X is missing. It is like exactly. An it is an operator. System. The hardware of tensor product is not an operator system in general. Yes, it's yes. a problem. Uh, there is a problem there. It's not an operator system. So uh, we have designed with George and with Adrianus a tensor product that gives you an operator system that way. So it's the right the right one to work with if you want to have to obtain such a factorization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And do you also have... that. Sorry. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. No, 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 I, I'm listening. Um, so, but then you view X as an operator space or rather like as a Hilbert module? Like, as an operator as space. TRO. So these will be both operator systems. They will be both yes. operator systems. This yes. one, it will be an operator space that you can assume to be bimodule over the multipliers of S and T, over the sister multipliers of S and T. Okay. Okay. Correct. But it doesn't even need to be uh, TRO. It doesn't even need to be TRO. Okay. But this is so you could also... actually one of the things. One of I believe one. Sorry, go ahead. So you could also replace X star with Y. Uh, Alex. You could also replace an oh, X star with a, with a. Oh, can you still? Uh, so, it, so... I was disconnected for a short while. Yes. Yes. So you could also replace X star with Y. In this, uh, in this, um, in this, um, like tensor product construction. Yes, yes, you can replace it by the suitable tensor product here, by a suitable tensor product. It's not the hardware of tensor product, but a metrical equivalent to it. No, no, he meant to replace x star with a with a different, with a y, with a. Exactly. With no, y. no, 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 no. I don't think so. I don't think so. So, so I'm thinking of this because I'm no, this thinking is, like this exactly. Uh, I think, uh, right. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking of yeah. this because of the you know like that. So uh, um, sorry. Uh, yeah, I I don't know. I don't know what will happen. That will be a different equivalence, maybe right? Because you may you may try to to factorize like that. That is completely correct, right? Yes. This may be your T, and this may be your S. This is correct, and the, the resemblance this this bearish to this is exactly the same as the resemblance of Bletcher et al. approach to Morita equivalence to Eleftherakis et al. approach to Morita equivalence, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. Bletcher is working with two. Basically, his idea is work with two spaces x and y, 
And George Alekarak's idea was work with one space that's a TRO, M. Yeah, and work okay. only with that. So okay, I nice. guess this is the, the analogy here. But I yeah. guess it will be a different type of equivalent, but I don't know. I don't know. I see, I see. I see, yes, I see. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, thank you very much. All right, thanks. Also for the lovely discussion, really. Any, anything last before we close here? So if not, let's uh, thank Ivan again. So a great Thank talk. you very much. Thank you very much indeed, yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, and we will uh, meet again in two weeks, at least for the European note of the, of the seminar. All right, bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye.